Well, good morning, all. Uh, I think we'll try to get started. Uh, I'm Stephen Flanagan, uh, Henry Kissinger Chair and mm -hmm. Senior Vice President here at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, and it's a pleasure to welcome uh, such a, a, a thoughtful and uh, and uh, engaged audience this morning. I, I know uh, we, we're delighted when we saw the list of, of those of you who uh, took time on a fine spring day to come out and talk about what's a rather gloomy situation in transatlantic affairs. But uh, uh, one point I want to make at the outset is, uh, as, uh, particularly to our European uh, friends in the audience, that uh, to paraphrase Lyndon Johnson, uh, as, a, as a group of our, to our fellow transatlanticists, we come to you today with heavy heart. Uh, uh, we're not here to throw stones or lay blame or to add fuel to a new burden-sharing debate, but we want to talk about how we all work through this period of, uh, of difficult fiscal situation uh, in defense and foreign assistance and how the transatlantic relationship can survive uh, the new austerity. So we're delighted uh, to have this opportunity to discuss with you and with uh, also, of course, a number of our American uh, friends and colleagues uh, the findings of our report, uh, a diminished transatlantic partnership question mark, and I underscore the question mark. We're not saying it's inevitable, but, uh, but the bottom, uh, the, 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 sub, the, the uh, secondary title uh, suggests that this is the challenge we've got we've to deal with. So um, we, uh, in the, when we, our first draft of this report, we had a number of European colleagues uh, uh, we, uh, who we helped us uh, in reviewing this draft, and they said we had been a little bit too diplomatic in the way we discussed uh, the trends that we saw both in, in the European fiscal situation and, and uh, the impact that it would have on defense and foreign affairs. So we want to try to, to get to that uh, to today in a, in a more uh, direct and dramatic and, and, and candid fashion. Um, and because we do really believe that absent uh, dramatic action, uh, the European side of the transatlantic partnership of the last six decades in uh, maintaining international security and promoting a global development is in danger of being hollowed out by some of the trends that we see. Uh, and we're all going to have to, on both sides of the transatlantic partnership, going to figure out a way to get better value for the available resources that will be out there over the next five years, certainly, uh, for both of those uh, endeavors. And at a time when we know uh, that uh, defense uh, in particular and foreign assistance is not uh, a priority of governments facing uh, very difficult choices at home and, and pressures to address uh, pr uh, pressing uh, needs such as uh, unemployment and maintaining social safety nets. And indeed, the U.S. is facing, uh, as I say, similar uh, decisions, uh, calls certainly on Capitol Hill for sharp reductions in development assistance, uh, some tough decisions uh, head on defense. Uh, of course, we have the benefit of operating off a much uh, higher long-term level of, of, uh, of uh, uh, defense spending, but, uh, but we still have uh, uh, some erosion of capabilities and some challenges in maintaining them uh, over the longer term that will have to be addressed. So but we are here to talk primarily the European side of the equation, but, uh, but we certainly are open to, to talking about how this relates and, and indeed some of the the suggestions that we have, the policy recommendations on how to uh, maintain uh, the transatlantic capacity in these areas uh, do get to the heart of, of, of action on both sides of the Atlantic. So our plan this morning, uh, we have, a, as I said, we, we realize we have a very well-informed audience familiar with some of the general trends that we're going to talk about. Uh, so we want to really have this to be a dialogue and to get quickly through some of our main uh, findings and recommendations. So I'll provide a brief overview of some of the, the, these key findings on the long-term economic challenge. Uh, and uh, then I'll turn to my colleague uh, in, in the middle of the panel here, uh, Heather Conley, our director of our, our Europe program and a former Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Northern and Central Europe, who, uh, who will provide some perspectives on overseas development assistant uh, impacts and uh, on how Europe is doing. She's been doing a great deal of work, as some of you know, on, on following how Europe is doing in managing some of the current economic turmoil. And then I'll turn to my colleague David Berteau, director of our Defense Industrial Initiatives Group and, and a long time, many service uh, in a number of positions in the Pentagon before that, uh, who has done great work including one of the other studies that you see out there today. He and his colleagues from our Defense Industrial Initiatives Group have done uh, a, a, another assessment of the uh, uh, European defense spending over the last two decades, which he's holding up. That uh, also is, uh, is out there available. Uh, um, and uh, that, that report was written before the fiscal crisis, so we have more copies of that to give out. We only had, uh, reflecting the new austerity, we only have copies of the executive summary of the current report to give out, but it is available on our website. Um, to the whole group. So, and then I'll turn and come back to defense capabilities and uh, and uh, and some of the impact on uh, uh, on uh, some of the uh, proposals that we have for how do we uh, mitigate uh, the the uh, the impact of the financial crisis. So, 
what um, one of the things we looked at, and, and, uh, and it was sort of looking at the economic and political context, was uh, what are the uh, what is the impact of uh, of the financial crisis and the subsequent European sovereign debt crisis on uh, the overall capacity, and how what were the longer term economic trends? Uh, and how, and, and again, we're talking in broad brush about, about Europe as a whole, the EU 27 in particular, when we're talking economics here. But, but what we've seen is, uh, is sort of the, the big headline trend is that the good news at some level is that the cuts in defense and, and even uh, more so in foreign assistance over the past two years since the onset of the crisis have not overall been as deep as some has, had feared and indeed not nearly as deep as some of the cuts in other discretionary spending in European countries. So defense and foreign assistance even more so has been, as uh, our British friends would say, ring-fenced a bit uh, from some of the, the more uh, heavier or closer haircuts. Uh, but, uh, but the fact is, I think this is not sustainable, and we're seeing it already uh, in, in uh, some of the discussions that's underway. And, and even, again, we're talking broad brush about Europe as 27 here. It, it differs in, in various countries. But over the next five years, we think that uh, capabilities in the defense area are, are definitely uh, going to decline off a base that reflects two uh, decades of underinvestment that's documented in the earlier uh, Defense Industrial Initiatives Group report. Uh, that ambitious uh, foreign assistance plans are going to be trimmed, and Europe's level of ambition in the world is going to be tempered by uh, demands of getting its economic and political house in order. And the public discontent, the protests that we see in Greece and Spain, even in the UK over, over cuts to the NHS and, and, uh, and to education, I think is a, is a sign of the kind of, uh, of, of political challenges that governments are going to face in Europe uh, in maintaining uh, commitments to uh, defense and foreign assistance. Now, just some quick headlines on the longer-term trends, and I want to let get Heather uh, up here to talk about development assistance. But what we looked at, as we looked at, and, and um, with the exception of Heather and maybe David a little bit more, I'm certainly no economist, but we looked at some of the long-term uh, trends here and, and some of the best projections of, uh, of all of the, the key analytic, uh, 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 the key analyses of longer-term defense, uh, uh, I mean, of longer-term economic, the longer-term economic situation. And what we found was, that um, most of these, the EU27 is going to experience an average annual growth rate about 1.5% uh, uh, through 2013, with a continuing risk of a, of a double-dip double recession and weak growth by historical standards out to at least 2015. So uh, the sense of the new normal, if you will, uh, is going to be very, very modest growth. And of course, there are some exceptions, uh, you know, Germany and others. Turkey, of course, is doing better than, than that. But, but others, uh, you know, as a whole, the, this is going to be a problem. And of course, mounting debt, Heather will talk a little bit about this, but, in, uh, but mounting debt, which could grow from about 80% of gross domestic product in 2010 to uh, more than 100% of GDP by 2015, without uh, difficult policy uh, cha challenges. And um, there are these other longer-term macroeconomic imbalances that we're going to see, uh, a large output gaps, high unemployment, and wide fiscal deficits, uh, and the need to exit from uh, exception, uh, exceptionally loose monetary policy. Now, one of the other things that, that uh, the, the economic analysis suggests is that even as if there is a, a near-term and effective solution to the current sovereign debt crisis, Europe's implicit debts, that is to say the cost of maintaining the social safety net of an aging population and many other costs are, are going to be uh, quite uh, difficult and in terms of what the even growth potential is. Uh, some of this is due to demographic trends, which are going to increase the ratio of, of taxpayers to uh, uh, pensioners to taxpayers. It's going to lead to a sustainability gap. So aside from the current demands, we're going to see growing, uh, you know, limited uh, resources to support an aging population, uh, and such that the GDP potential growth of the EU27 uh, in the in the further out period, out to 2020, is likely to see a fall from what was been projected at about 2.4 percent to about 1.7 percent uh, in the following two decades. So. I think that you see that uh, we're going to see this uh, this uh, uh, continuing constraint uh, absent some uh, some other adjustments in policy. So that is the overall economic and 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 political context in which we now will look at how is this impacting overseas development official development assistance and uh, defense industry. Uh, I'll turn first to Heather, and then and then David will come up and talk about the defense industry. So thank you. 
Thank you, Steve. Uh, good morning, everyone. I, I want to just have a personal note. What a pleasure it has been to work on this project and to have an opportunity to work with, with David and Steve. Um, and, and this truly is a story uh, that we're just at the beginning of. So I hope this, this report and, and some of our comments help provide a, a frame, a frame of reference for the story that we're going to have to watch uh, really closely over the next uh, several months to, to next several years. Just a very, very brief comment on just sort of the snapshot of this morning's uh, news that we're seeing that the 10-year yield on the Greek bond and difference to the German Bund is now at a record high. We're seeing pressure on bond yields on Spain's debt, Portuguese, Irish debt. Um, typically how Europe has, has ad addressed these types of significant challenges is the muddle through challenge, which means try to wait it out, try to you know, work through the problem. That strategy for Europe with regard to the sovereign debt crisis is closing rapidly. So we're at that moment, that fork at the road, if you will, whether this crisis is going to serve as an opportunity for a quantum leap in integration for both fiscal union uh, and, and, and a stronger economic union or we're going to see the potential for the rollback of the integration project. And I can't begin to tell you, and, and my colleagues, my apologies, they, they hear me say this every single day, um, this crisis is the defining and shaping event for Europe, how it projects its power and its own internal development. So uh, it's, this project, in, in, in many respects, is, is extremely important to, to understanding Europe and understanding the implications for the transatlantic relationship. But turning to uh, overseas development assistance, official development assistance, I have to tell you the story right now is good. Um, and uh, I want to assure you that Europe's soft power, its ODA, uh, is truly its power. And I, I don't usually like to use PowerPoint, but I thought that the numbers here help shape the story. Uh, so I'm going to go a little bit into the numbers uh, and then t talk a bit about the methodology of how we looked uh, inside Europe uh, to see what's going on with the austerity measures, how it's affecting overseas development assistance. So if you just take a quick look at our, my first graph, the power here. Uh, European totals for uh, official development assistance, 80.8 .8 billion, that's 67% of the entire uh, total. These are uh, OECD figures from the Development Assistance Committee. The U.S., in contrast, uh, is 28 billion, which is only 23%. So this is uh, Europe's uh, very uh, strong leadership and, and power. As, and, and I want you to also see from institutional to member state, uh, while the EU, uh, the Commission as an institution is a strong uh, provider of assistance, you see where the strength really comes uh, from the member states. And again, you see some pretty significant totals there. So great, great strength and power. Now let's dig a little deeply uh, uh, into uh, the, the individual member state uh, contribution. Uh, and again, there was some method to our, our, our madness here. What I wanted to do as we jumped into the numbers was divide into three groups. I wanted to look at the impact uh, uh, on the periphery. So the, the, the country I chose to look at was Ireland. I could have ch uh, chosen uh, Portugal. I could have uh, chosen potentially Greece. Uh, but I, I want to take a look at Ireland. It, when we did our report, we only had the benefit of the 2009 OECD numbers. Subsequently, the 2010 uh, numbers came out. You're not seeing an extraordinary amount of difference in Ireland. I, I will kind of come back to what's going on underneath those numbers. But look at Spain. Portugal hasn't changed, but I think in part because 70% of Portuguese ODA is tied aid. That's helping their export markets, and I think that's been protecting it in, in some respects. You look at the UK, it increase, Germany, an increase, and then the Netherlands and, and Poland. So I grouped them. I looked at the periphery, I looked at the core Europe, meaning UK and Germany, and then I looked at what I'm calling the outliers, which was looking at some different things going on in the ODA community. Poland was not dramatically affected by um, the economic crisis initially, 2009, it actually had positive growth. In the Netherlands, there's been some interesting coalition politics that have gone into driving uh, some of the, the future policies, but I just wanted to give you a, a sense of, of diving into those, into those numbers. 
Okay, so let's take a look at the periphery. I wish I could tell you last fall as we were deciding the countries to study that I knew the president was visiting three out of the five countries uh, next week. Um, I'd like to take credit for that, but I can't. But I think this will help uh, uh, with uh, as President Obama takes his uh, European trip next week uh, to see some of the impact uh, that the e economic crisis has uh, provided to, to Europe. So let's take a look at Ireland. You know, Ireland uh, really uh, the last several years came on as a very very strong uh, presence and power in ODA, in its soft power, becoming the ranked fifth in the EU uh, as a most generous ODA donor, seventh most generous in per capita terms in the world. In 2009, we saw a drop off of um, a reduction of 224 million euros. What's important about that reduction is that 80% of Irish aid goes to sub-Saharan Africa. It's a very targeted poverty alleviation focus. And what we're seeing, and I'll come back to that trend line, is this has huge implications for development to sub-Saharan Africa. Um, a foreign aid is v was very popular in Ireland. It, it absolutely held uh, a strong public opinion and surveys. What we're seeing since the impos imposition of the austerity measures that's starting to decline. People are having to make choices. Uh, and that, that overarching and, and overwhelming sense of generosity is starting to become uh, under, under some challenge. And I think that's something also for us to watch as a trend line across Europe. So again, we are seeing a diminishment. We're going to have to watch next year's budget, uh, obviously, uh, as, as the austerity measures really come into play. So that's just an example of what we're seeing in the periphery. Let's go to core. And you know, obviously, the UK is the standard bearer for ODA, and, and, and DFID has been exemplary. The UK has tripled its ODA in real terms. It's the fourth largest aid donor. It is actually, it's, uh, uh, when the UK announced its comprehensive spending review, one of the two things that were ring-fenced uh, was DFID, um, as well as uh, some protection of uh, the National Health Service. Now, you have to look into that, though. Uh, DFID was protected and, in fact, uh, increased uh, its, uh, its budget by 35%, at the same time decreasing administrative costs by 33%. So they're doing more, but they're significantly reducing administrative oversight. And I think, again, you'll see that trending here in Washington, it's going to be trending across uh, across the spectrum. We're also seeing some uh, reprioritization and, and readjustments. The UK has established uh, a commission to oversee and analyze current assistance, trying to get those efficiencies. They're reprioritizing. They're not funding aid uh, programs to Russia and to China. We're seeing again a much greater focus on poverty alleviation and their Millennium Development Goals. So we're seeing leadership there, but you're seeing some changes within, within that dynamic. Now, I looked at Germany, obviously, because of its ex exceptional economic growth, uh, seeing if that, uh, that we're seeing some stronger uh, benefits in, in, in Germany. Uh, in 2009, there was a 12% uh, percent reduction uh, in German aid. Some of that, uh, Germany is now focusing more on uh, providing loans, sort of reducing that grant debt relief. Uh, we saw some small increases in 2010 focusing on Afghanistan, uh, the part of their assistance work there, and climate adaptation financing. Um, what we're seeing across the board, uh, Germany is, is failing to meet uh, some of its commitments that it made at the G8 summit in 2005 and Glen Eagles, and it's certainly a, a percentage of uh, the, the a shortfall that we're seeing in, in the total EU contribution to its ODA. I'd like to see a little more focus, a little more vision uh, for German assistance, and we're certainly not seeing where its economic leadership, its ODA leadership is falling behind that. Finally, my two outliers. We're not seeing um, an incredible amount of, of leadership from Poland and ODA, small increases, but it's focused on Afghanistan, where 30 percent of its ODA goes. We're looking at uh, uh, a concentration of its assistance on its neighbors, Belarus, Moldova, Ukraine, Georgia, the Eastern Partnership Initiative. Um, and I think you're going to see, and this will probably be announced a lot next week when the President visits, visits Warsaw, uh, a lot of work on democracy promotion um, and, and seeing where uh, Poland's niche value is, is democracy promotion. But you're not seeing, again, economically a, a burst uh, for Poland, uh, as you would think, because its, econo its economy is, uh, is growing. And as a new member, not necessarily taking those, those important steps. Finally, the Netherlands. 
I, I chose the Netherlands because I was seeing some interesting behaviors based on the new coalition government. And while the Netherlands is a, a wonderful and strong ODA partner and contributor, we're seeing now that there is a reduction of 4.5% um, uh, in its ODA. As part of the coalition agreement in 2010, it will reduce its foreign aid budget by a billion euro. It's seeking to expand the definition of its ODA. It wants to include peacekeeping. It wants to include its work, uh, work in Afghanistan. And uh, you're starting to see where uh, some of the coalition uh, developments uh, and this is the introduction uh, of some of the, the Gert Wilders influence, is having an impact on ODA. Finally, some trends, and this is not going to be music to uh, many of our AID colleagues' uh, ears. We're seeing that there's going to be a significant decrease in the commitments that were previously made to sub-Saharan Africa. Um, that's just a, an effect of both austerity and I think some existing trend lines. We're going to see a return to tide aid where export markets for these countries are going to receive their ODA and it's not necessarily targeting um, uh, a poverty alleviation. We're going to expand the definition of ODA. We're going to demand efficiencies. Great, uh, great scrutiny over uh, the aid that is provided. Loans are going to be increased and grant aid will be decreased, which will increase the debt burden uh, for developing countries. And clearly we're going to see a huge need to coordinate. And one of the recommendations that came out of this report and what we're seeing, uh, the Obama administration announced after the US-EU Lisbon summit in November, a US-EU coordination of, of assistance. I think next week in the UK there'll be some announcements about US-UK uh, work on trying to coordinate this development assistance. Um, so we're starting just to see the beginning of austerity. It's not going to have, it's going to be impactful this year and next year. We don't have the numbers to reflect that. But I think it speaks to greater coordination and also how does the private sector, the role of the private sector development play into this space. So it's an ongoing story and I thank you very much and with that I will turn to David. Oh, is, is offering the good news story today of uh, that, a, that we have a finding of a healthy and diversified defense industrial base, but uh, questions about declining demand. So, David, right. over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, like Heather, I would like to uh, express my gratitude for the opportunity to have worked with my partners up here uh, today. One of the uh, one of the elements of coming to a think tank is you can walk in with the illusion that it's actually easier to cooperate inside a nonprofit organization than it is inside a profit-making firm. Um, it turns out that's actually not true, but, um, but if you work at it enough, you, you can do it and it does have enormous benefits. I would also like to thank the work of my uh, staff, in, both in terms of the project here and our, our contributions here and our broader European defense spending and defense trends uh, activities. Guy Ben-Ari, who is my deputy in the Defense Industrial Initiatives Group, Roy Levy, uh, Joachim Hofbauer, I think, is here. Uh, Greg Sanders, I think, is actually working on Afghanistan now and is not here today because it turns out Europe is not the only problem we have uh, on, on the planet. Um, I'm, I'm particularly uh, reminded of, of back when I was a government civil servant and I was first emerging from, uh, from living paycheck to paycheck and somebody asked me about my investments and I said, well, that's easy. All of my investments are in debt. Um, at the time, I meant it as a joke, but it turns out the economic reality of the day is almost everybody else is in the same boat now. And, uh, and I think that if we measure the future by post-crisis Europe, it's a very interesting way of thinking about it. I'm going to limit my remarks to the section of our report, which is largely constituted in Chapter 4 and a little bit of Chapter 5. That's pages 9 and 10 in your executive summary. And give you a couple of summary comments and then talk a little bit about what we might extrapolate that from where it's going. Um, defense spending, of course, in Europe is down over the last decade. That's obvious to everybody. We've documented it pretty thoroughly. It's down a little bit under an average of 2% per year across all European countries, more in some, less in others. Um, but intriguingly, of course, the spending per soldier, and here I use the word soldier as multi-service and multi-named, if you will, is actually up. Because over the last decade, force structures has come down faster than spending has come down. And, and that's actually a, an astonishing phenomenon. I wish I could say that this is according to somebody's plan. 
It's not. It's just what happened. All right? And actually, interestingly enough, there's opportunity for that to continue in the aggregate, but not in most countries. Uh, because there are a few places where force structure is still probably excessive to any future use or threat. And so there's an opportunity for additional force structure reductions. Um, the second kind of surprising element from our perspective is that typically in the United States when we have dramatic reductions in defense spending, the accounts that are reduced the most, both in terms of percentage and in terms of dollars, are the investment accounts. The procurement account from an appropriations point of view, the research and development account, the, thing, the, the, the money that goes to buy uh, systems and, and uh, end items and products. Why? Because actually if you cut them this year, you actually save money this year. Most of you here in the personnel business know that it actually costs money to cut people at least initially because you've got to pay all of their accumulated sick leave and their retirement and then you've got to hire somebody else to take their place or figure out how to spread their work, give it to a contractor, whatever. So you actually get reductions in the current year when you make reductions in the investment accounts. You don't if you make those in, uh, reductions in people. Um, that's not what's happened in Europe over the last decade. And in fact, the investment accounts, procurement and R&D, and it's a little hard to tease the data out the same way that we do it in the U.S., but we've got a pretty good representation, have actually been better protected than um, than the other uh, ways in which money is spent. This has been good for industry, right, because actually that's where industry makes their most, most of their money. Um, one of the things that we do is we track the performance of defense industry companies both here in the U.S. We have our own U.S. defense index that we track, and we also have created a European defense index of, of publicly traded companies. A little harder in Europe because the ownership structures are a little bit different than they are in the U.S. and a little harder to get publicly traded uh, data. But we do this really for, for two reasons. One is we want to see how European defense companies are performing compared to other companies, if you will, like kinds of companies in the manufacturing and the technology business, et cetera. And we also want to look at how the financial market looks at them. Because ultimately, defense companies have to have access to capital the same way all other companies do, or else the government ends up paying their full freight. If they're not competitive in the global financial market, then they're not going to be able to get capital at attractive terms. They're not going to be able to invest. They're not going to be able to sustain their growth. They won't be able to maintain the jobs that are in place today. What we have found over the last decade is that European defense companies are performing on a comparable level with non-defense companies in the European global market. Right? That's probably not a surprise if you think about it. On the other hand, we're not sure anybody else has ever looked at it and, and come to that conclusion. Now, the real question is, what does all that mean going forward? Because that's a nice way of looking back at the last decade and say this is what we've seen. What do we project going forward? Much tougher. I'll come back to that in a minute. I want to lay out a couple of things first, though, because one of the questions that comes into play as you're reducing both force structure and spending is how are you going to maintain any kind of defense capability? And this is true at the country by country level, and it's true in the aggregate, as Heather hinted, f across uh, NATO and the European Union and all of Europe. This is a much, much more expansive question than just a question of money and what you're getting for it. But clearly, it opens up enormous new opportunities for collaboration, for specialization, for cooperation across boundaries, across programs, um, so that, in fact, collectively, we gain more capability for fewer uh, dollars spent or fewer euros spent. Um, now, that's easy to say. History says it's pretty darn hard to do. What's the future of multilateral cooperation? There have been some good examples, but none of them have been cheap, and they have tended to be focused on large, platform-driven, long-term, multi-year, multi-billion euro programs. Similarly, with transatlantic defense cooperation, the focus has been on the big program. And of course, those of you who have been here before know that uh, I boldly predicted that we would not see the termination of MEADS until we had something to take its place. Um, I was flat wrong, unless you consider nothing to be something, uh, because that's in fact what has, has taken its place. But I think that the opportunity is still there, and it's there both inside a European cooperation point of view and from a transatlantic cooperation point of view, but the target has got to be smaller, more focused kinds of cooperations rather than large platform-based or, or major multi-billion multi, uh, dollar or multi-billion euro programs. I don't see, however, anybody working that idea into reality. And if you look at the 
the recent developments, particularly uh, post MEADS, no one is raising sort of, okay, where are there other opportunities for cooperation that could come into play? Some of them are coming up at the bilateral level, but there's no good multilateral approach uh, yet visible to do that. I think we're kind of missing an opportunity. So what does that mean for the industry? What it means for the industry is you're not going to have your big markets domestically in an intra-European sense unless something changes. And on a global sense, the export markets, of course, offer enormous opportunity, but we have a couple of constraints. One of the biggest constraints is U.S. export controls. And uh, obviously we have an effort underway in the U.S. to streamline and, and uh, modernize that approach. Uh, we all know the mantra of uh, higher walls around fewer uh, products. Um, we also know that that mantra has yet to materialize in anything other than op-eds and, and uh, uh, articles. And so we're still moving forwards, uh, but at a pace that's not discernibly different than standing still. Uh, and so, uh, uh, you know, it may be some uh, psychoelectronic activity underway, um, but as yet, no, the regulations themselves are not fundamentally changed. You also have the potential chilling effect of uh, the WTO rulings, uh, although, as near as I can tell, uh, that's going to play out through the appeal process for probably longer than I'm going to be in my position here, and so uh, I'm not, I'm not going to predict exactly the end date of that. Um, finally, though, there is a European counterpart on the export controls, and that is uh, we're nearing the implementation dates for the EU directives on procurement and on transfers, which, if carried through to their logical conclusion, could lead to an opportunity for a, an ITAR-free, single-license, intra-European transfer for European companies in which U.S. companies may not be able to participate. Um, this is an understudied area, one that we continue to watch very closely. But if you look at all of these elements together, I think you have the opportunity for doing a, a couple of things on collaboration and specialization. Um, you have almost no U.S. government support in favor of that, not much visibility to it, if you will. Uh, we've suffered two secretaries of defense in a row now, spread out over 11 years almost, who believe that Europe is not important in terms of investing in partnership capacity and development. Um, whether or not that changes with the incoming new secretary of defense remains to be seen, and it, I think will be as much driven by opportunities as it will be by policy. And so I look forward, I think, to, uh, to our questions as we look at some of these pieces and how they fit with the other dynamics that we've talked about this morning. Steve, back to you. Okay, thank you, David. Thank you, and let me just uh, wrap up with some of the, the issues that we see in, in defense capabilities and, and how to get through this uh, in terms of managing uh, a better uh, and getting better value for, for resources available. Um, picking up where David took, uh, left off, though, I think what we see then in the out years, uh, he talked about the trend lines that we've seen. Uh, the, the sense that, w as we looked at, at budget plans, uh, some program laws of different countries and, and just the fiscal realities, what we think we see is uh, there are going to be further rec cuts required in force levels, uh, in capabilities, and, and, and particularly in readiness, uh, particularly for those uh, forces that are, that are not engaged in current operations, um, as well as some deferred procurements uh, and eroding, uh, and an overall erosion, I think, of, of European military capabilities uh, in, that, in that out year period. Um, the, uh, the cost of current operations, I mean, this is the one area where most governments have, uh, as, as, you know, obviously we see in the U.S. too with the notion of providing support to forces in the field, um, that uh, becomes the priority and it has been so far. But in a, in a number of cases, particularly in some of the major contributors such as the U.K., the, 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 the source of funding has been extra budgetary outside the defense budget. That's been a, that, and good news at some level uh, because, of course, it has taken that, uh, some of that burden off of, uh, off of already, uh, uh, you know, but defense budgets feeling a great deal of pressure. But uh, how long that extra budgetary uh, funding can be re uh, maintained is questionable. The U.K. And, uh, has certainly main, uh, has said very explicitly that it's, uh, the, the current coalition has maintained its commitment to the, the 2014 uh, end of the transition period to Afghan lead and security. But, but a number of other countries, uh, certainly, uh, that, that kind of level of commitment and the ability to sustain the operations, particularly those countries that are paying for current operations, not only, of course, now Afghanistan, but also Libya, out of, out of uh, defense budgets, 
uh, is, is, is taking its toll, and we already see some of the uh, limitations, uh, some forces complaining that they're uh, run, having shortages in Libya of, of munitions, of uh, particularly pre of costly precision strike munitions, uh, difficulty maintaining the operational tempo, uh, both of, of air and naval forces in the region. So um, again, we're talking very broad brush, but I think this is some of the challenge that we're going to see. Now, Afghanistan, of course, has been transformative, and I think we shouldn't, um, we shouldn't uh, overlook the fact that uh, European forces and Canadian forces have been really transformed by their experience in Afghanistan. Uh, they become more expeditionary, uh, their level of readiness of, the, of, those, uh, of those forces that have been deployed there, and they tend to be the same forces or same units deployed time and time again, have seen uh, their, their uh, training and capabilities uh, uh, really uh, develop. But, but for those other forces that are not in go and going to be involved in those current op in future uh, current operations, both Afghanistan through, say, 2014, 2015, and whatever other operations NATO will be and other uh, European countries will be engaged in with the United States, we're probably going to see uh, the readiness and capacity of some of those um, uh, secondary forces, the, the less ready forces, to, uh, to continue to erode, and particularly in the area of, of reduced training costs uh, for, for pilots and for, uh, for other aspects of, of uh, field exercises and, and, and other, other things that will maintain uh, those capabilities. Um, and, and certainly we see a growing interest uh, among uh, European governments for, uh, if you look at various white papers, uh, certainly Afghanistan has been a strain on all of our, all of our, all of the uh, contributing states. Uh, much more emphasis on crisis management, on, on operations that uh, have clear in and out uh, strategies and that uh, uh, have very explicit uh, uh, sort of timelines about, about exit uh, dates. Uh, and not some, you know, open-ended and the fear of mission creep, which of course has, has taken its toll. We also think that, that the fiscal constraints, when you look at the impact on NATO, uh, both uh, the Lisbon Summit Capabilities Package and looking towards any kind of initiative uh, in the 2012 NATO Summit on capabilities, I think there's a great deal of uncertainty about how much of, of those capabilities can be realized. Uh, uh, it's, I think it was telling that, of course, even that the fact that it was called a capabilities package and not a commitment uh, in the end of the day was, was, was a sign of, of uncertainty about how much of it could, could truly be realized. And I think also in missile defense, there's a great deal of uncertainty about uh, how, uh, what part of the cost European governments are prepared to provide for the development of a comprehensive NATO missile defense system. Now we looked. We focus on uh, the, the capabilities of the of the three most capable uh, European NATO allies: the UK, France, and Germany. Uh, and, and what they do will be determinate. These three, of course, represent about 65 percent of all defense uh, expenditure in NATO Europe, and about 88 percent of, of of research and technology investment. Um, and just quickly, I mean, you, uh, many of you uh, know the, the details, and of course we have representatives of a number of these governments here can, can talk uh, to, to their, their plans and intentions. But I think what we see is an overall commitment of those three to certainly maintain uh, sizable and, uh, and sustainable capabilities for uh, a number of contingencies. Um, uh, the UK's uh, defense uh, security and defense review calls for about 8 percent cut in defense spending over the next four years and levels off, but uh, there will be further cuts after 2014. In all likelihood, there are a number of uh, so-called unfunded mandates that, uh, that, have to be, uh, that have to be dealt with, uh, uh, fund programs that are not fully funded out through the, uh, the lifetime of their procurement costs that are, that are going to cause uh, uh, difficult decisions ahead. But that said, uh, and the UK has is, is made a commitment that it will uh, be able to have the capability to lead a, uh, be the lead nation in a, in a coalition operation or a NATO-led operation uh, and maintaining a self-sustaining uh, brigade of, of force of about a size of about 6,500 soldiers uh, capable of being deployed anywhere in the world and sustained indefinitely. Now, we've already seen, though, some questioning, second-guessing about that some of the decisions of the SDSR, even just this week, Lord Stanhope, the uh, uh, Lord of the Ad no, of the Navy, uh, suggesting that his wish list, he might have wished he could have, if, if we could redo uh, the uh, Strategic Defense and, and Security Review, perhaps uh, we would have taken a harder look at the carrier decision to take the, uh, the carriers and the, uh, and, the, and the strike capabilities of the Harry aircraft out of service, that that certainly would have improved options uh, with regard to Libya. But, uh, again, that's, that's another matter. We've seen other questions about strains on, on current operations in, in, the, in the Air Forces uh, and how pilots were being trained or not trained for ground attack in the case of the Typhoon. Uh, many, a number of other questions out there, but we, we, let's not 
get into too many of the details. And the French white paper on defense, of course, had already set a course before the financial crisis had, had sunk in in, uh, in, uh, in full effect. Uh, the 2008 paper had set a course for a, a force size uh, uh, re reducing to, from about 270 to 225,000 uh, with corresponding budget cuts uh, over the subsequent uh, six to seven years. The, uh, the 2011 plan uh, calls for a further reduction in defense spending through 2013. But Paris is, con is committed to maintaining uh, the capacity to simultaneously field 30,000 soldiers deployable within six months for a period of one year or for a major operation. And we'll have a 5,000 uh, strong reserve force on permanent operational alert with uh, another 10,000 available for territorial defense. So again, all of the these three countries trying to manage uh, uh, in difficult circumstances, but maintaining that, that uh, sort of these, uh, these countries maintaining that commitment to some uh, expeditionary and, and substantial expeditionary capability. Now in Germany, of course, just this week, um, uh, Foreign Defense Minister de Maizière has just uh, uh, come forward with the, uh, the final assessment after a number of uh, internal German reviews of, of their defense planning. Uh, an, uh, including the calls for an abolishment of conscription, conscription and a cut in troop levels from about 250,000 to a maximum of about 185,000. There would be 170,000 professionals uh, plus uh, a number of, uh, of uh, reservists with a five to 15,000 maximum of short-term volunteers who would come in uh, for a, a period of 12 to 24 months. Now, I think there were some good currents in, uh, and maybe some post-Libya reconsideration in some of the rhetoric surrounding the release of de Maizière's uh, report. Uh, the quote I thought was very telling, prosperity brings responsibility and that Germany needs to take greater responsibility to consider uh, interests that require engagement and the consequences of not engaging. And I thought that was uh, very telling. Uh, the report came out, uh, the de Maizière plan comes out on the somewhat closer to the higher end, not quite as high as, as some uh, plans, the, the so-called Visa plan had talked about of up to 14,000, but it was agreed that about 10,000 uh, German soldiers should be available for two major, uh, including one as a, as a lead nation, that is with a brigade size force, uh, and up to six minor operations uh, over a period of, of, uh, of several months. So I, I think that uh, we see at least some uh, sense in the German uh, decisions here about uh, the need to maintain uh, a more, uh, a fairly substantial capacity and, and that perhaps even some reconsideration of, uh, of, uh, of the consequences and the implications of its, of its opting out uh, of the Libyan mission. Now, in the context of these trends among the big three, I think we, if we look at the other allies, uh, NATO Europe really, uh, the bottom line is only going to be able to make, the, the rest of the alliance is really going to be able to make marginal contributions to capabilities to undertake various missions absent a significant restructuring and, and much greater defense integration. Uh, most of the allies would be able to contribute something on, on the order of a battalion to future expeditionary operations. In the naval domain, allies will have the ability to contribute to a limited number of surface combatants for sea control, for maritime security, for humanitarian operations. Uh, but force levels are going to be constrained and operational uh, flexibility uh, and global presence is also going to have seen uh, some contraction. Air forces are going to be constrained by shrinking fleets reduce pilot training and tighten budgets that will uh, also constrain uh, sustained combat operations. And, and again, as I said, we are seeing this uh, in spades uh, in the context of the Libyan Operation um, uh, Unified Protector. So just quickly, some of the highlights of our, our suggestions on how do, we, how do we get through this in the defense area. One concern we found is that it strikes us that most European governments are pursuing defense reforms and reductions on a purely national basis. Uh, driven uh, largely by resource constraints with little or no reference to NATO or EU obligations. And some of these plans, indeed, a number of the reviews were undertaken well before uh, that even the new NATO strategic concept was adopted. The NATO defense planning process has been reformed and, and, and revised to, to try to, uh, to become uh, more effective in, in managing uh, some of these, but many say that it's not quite the right mechanism, it's too slow, and besides, a lot of allies have usually used the process to justify national decisions. Uh, Secretary General Rasmussen has talked about the need to have uh, so-called so smart defense to make sure that we're both getting maximum value for available resources, but also to ensure that he's used the term the coherence of the overall residual capability that's going to be out there. And I think that's really the key question that we see. And the whole question of can we adapt uh, perhaps the NATO defense planning, not to set up a new long-term defense plan or other kinds of capabilities commitments, but 
can, do we need to augment the traditional planning process and, and, and include a mechanism that would ensure that there is some greater reference to the out-year forces and how they're going to work together? How do they complement or not complement one another? And this, I think, is relevant also to the way the U.S. relates to a number of, of European defense cooperation initiatives that are undertaking, that are underway outside of NATO. Um, now, Allied Command Transformation is, is underway, uh, has underway a, uh, a process of looking at synchronizing and, and developing uh, capabilities for multinational capability development, pooling and sharing of capabilities, looking for opportunities uh, uh, in role specialization and other things that have been tried with some success, and I think that's all to, be, all to the good. Uh, but we are going to have to recognize that these, these cooperations uh, have to take into account uh, a, a, a great deal of differing uh, capabilities and goals and, and requirements within all of these nations. But, but there are some plans out there that I think merit some, some, uh, some uh, real attention and, and some support, including from the United States. Now, of course, the, the, the uh, Anglo-French uh, Defense Cooperation Treaty of 2010, I think, was an important step, one that certainly has been welcomed by the U.S. government, I think provides a, a real opportunity to uh, ensure the, the sustainability and, and capability of both those governments uh, in, in, uh, in the long term uh, as, as they uh, maintain capabilities and, and complementarity. And it is very much reflective of just that goal I was saying, that these two governments are looking at how their two forces will fit together. Uh, the British, indeed, of course, adapting their plans about the, the carrier uh, to sort of to have interoperability with the French uh, in the longer term to go to the, the through deck version of the Joint Strike Fighter. Um, uh, in the long term rather than the short takeoff version. So I think this is a kind of uh, step that, that has been welcomed, could be encouraged, but I think the U.S. should be more actively engaged in that discussion because what these two countries do clearly is going to have a big impact both on what other European allies do and all, also on permanent structured cooperation within the EU. Um, there are a number of other initiatives out there uh, in uh, various regional groupings, and I think that they tend to show the most promise uh, cooperation among the uh, Nordic Baltic states, the Visegrad, the uh, Poles have just announced in the last few days a commitment of a new uh, uh, battle group that would uh, be a Visegrad uh, battle group, uh, of a Weimar group uh, in, in uh, France and Poland and Germany, uh, working together and in, in, uh, in a number of other areas trying to shape uh, European contributions to this, and I think all of these uh, all of these are, are to be uh, to be commended, and, and that also we need to look at how they fit together within overall NATO capabilities. There's another uh, uh, German-Swedish initiative that also looking at a promise of EU pooling and sharing that has laid out some very, uh, I think, some very thoughtful uh, considerations of, of how this can work effectively, what nations are willing to truly share, where they want to, where they really do want to retain nation, national capabilities, and where they can. Uh, move forward to ensure that they are getting best value for resources. So uh, all of these things, I think, are things that, that we need to look at, at the more in the transatlantic dimension. How do we ensure that together uh, we are making uh, the right choices uh, and that there will be this complementarity of the residual capabilities that we're likely to see in both sides of the Atlantic in the defense area uh, um, in the period of 2015 and beyond? But that said, I think our bottom line is that with a healthy defense industrial base, a cadre of operationally uh, experienced and, 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 and effective forces, and its stater, status continuing as a, as a leader in soft power, uh, the, the prospect of, uh, of, of still uh, some recovery uh, uh, after, the, after some difficult period of austerity, Europe has the tools required to play a larger role in world affairs. Uh, but we're going to have to work closely together to ensure that that, uh, that the transatlantic ties in this, con in this context, that we don't end up into a, an acrimonious and difficult burden-sharing debate, and that, uh, that the overall coherence of our end-state capacities, uh, uh, both in defense and foreign assistance, are coming together uh, in the most effective way.